Good morning. I'm Pastor Richard Lewis, and we want to welcome you to the Cisna Park Rankin United Methodist Church's worship service today. Let us share together in our call to worship. Our God will supply every need of ours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God be glory forever and ever. Come, let us bring God our needs this day. To our God be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bow in prayer. You have brought us, O God, to another Lord's Day, when we are privileged to worship you with our brothers and sisters in Christ. May we have unity of mind and heart as we open ourselves to the movement of your Holy Spirit. As your love grows within us, may we have rich fellowship with you and with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture reading for this morning, for this Transfiguration Sunday, comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them any more, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Let's bow in prayer. Almighty God, we pray that you would open up our hearts to receive the message of your Holy Scripture, that the Holy Spirit will come upon us and give us understanding and that we will be able to follow in the footsteps of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. A young man went off to college with great expectations, and after he had been in college for a month, he texted his father, Feather in my cap, elected class president. Two months later, he sent another text to his father, Another feather in my cap, accepted into the best fraternity. And a month later, a third text, Still another feather in my cap, leading role in the class play. One semester later, he sent this text to his brother. Flunked out. Prepare father. Tell him to send money for me to get home. The brother texted him back. Father prepared. Prepare yourself. Father says, put those feathers on your shoulders and fly home. Ever talk yourself into a similar situation? Sometimes the need to open our mouths and show the world how clever we are confirms just the opposite. Without even seeing it coming, we stick our foot right into our mouth. What perverse drive is it that continually lands us in this awkward, graceless, foolish-looking position? Probably the greatest single cause of human stupidity? We are afraid of others and afraid of ourselves. The young man at that college was afraid to tell his father the truth about himself. Afraid to admit that he found the workload too heavy, the coursework too hard, the pace too daunting. So he devised his feather communications to project an image of his first experience at college as lighthearted and carefree, successful and satisfying. Socially, he was a feather floating on the air of acceptance from one success to the next. But scholastically, he was a stone. Not all the feathers in the world could help him when he sank out of sight academically, when he was unable to keep up with the classes, when he was unable to get the grades that he needed in order to stay in school. What might have happened to this young man if he had revealed his well-founded fear of the academic failure to his father instead of only communicating about the fluff in his life? He might have discovered that he wasn't the only person ever to have a tough time adjusting to college life. He might even have discovered that his father had similarly struggled. Fear is what Mark claims prompted Peter's silly offer to build little temporary shelters or booths on the mountaintop during the Transfiguration event. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Elijah and Moses were tremendously powerful, awe-inspiring prophets of God, and good reason for a healthy feeling of fear on Peter's part. We're giving this image of the ultimate prophet in Elijah. And we're given the lawgiver, Moses, all with Jesus on this mountaintop. Perhaps Jesus' harsh rebuke from the past was on Peter's mind. Get behind me, Satan, he said. But what if Elijah and Moses knew how Peter had rejected Jesus' words about his death and ultimate resurrection? 
What if they found him hopelessly disobedient and completely unfit for discipleship? Both Elijah and Moses had sent to their death more than a few weak-spirited, wrong-headed troublemakers in their time. The fear that grips Peter's stomach loosens his tongue and goads him into offering his odd suggestion before agonizing over all the theological implications that lie behind these booths, consider for a moment that Peter is afraid. Here is a simple fisherman who has gotten into the middle of an enormously complex theological, political, and now it looks like po possibly a suicidal situation. It seems that every time Peter opened his mouth, he says something wrong. Even when he says something right, you are the Messiah, he is silenced. So maybe in the fear that he will once again say something out of line, Peter offers to do something instead, to use his hands, not his head. Unfortunately, like most fear-motivated actions, his plan to avoid saying something stupid backfires, and he once again looks foolish. Some of you would probably remember the musical team, Gilbert and Sullivan, and they were doing very well until they bought a theater together. Then Sullivan decided it ought to be recarpeted, and so he bought the carpet, but Gilbert intercepted the bill. And when he got the bill, he was very angry and he hit the ceiling. He took Sullivan to court because he felt that as long as Sullivan had ordered the carpet without consulting him, he should not have to pay for it. It all wound up in a great lawsuit. There was no, so much anger that neither one of those men spoke to each other again as long as they lived. When Sullivan wrote the music, he sent it by messenger to Gilbert. Gilbert would pen the words and send it by messenger back to Sullivan. Then when they would have their wonderful performances, they would each come from opposite ends of the stage to take their bows. But they never looked at each other. They never said a word to each other again as long as they lived. They let anger and frustration and fear ruin their friendship. What motivates us to hold such a lasting grudge? Are we afraid that we might say something stupid, putting our foot in our mouth and looking foolish? While fear of ourselves and of others causes a large measure of our foot and mouth disease, there is another popular reason we open up when we should just shut up, silence. Few things are as unsettling to most of us as standing around in the midst of others and no one is speaking. Silence is something we accept with grace only from those we love the most and trust the best. How many people can you simply sit next to in silence without feeling the weight of the air between you? With whom can you maintain silence when walking on a quiet beach or sitting in the car on a long ride or waiting for the phone call with a lab report, keeping vigil against a soul's dark night, watching the sun come up? If we are lucky, we can keep silence with our spouse. Even luckier still are those who can add a few friends to the count. Silence is stillness, and keeping still involves taking that risk. When we're talking, we're moving. We're hard to get, grasp, and we're hard to hold down. We feel like we're in control, and we can still move. We can still flee and escape. But sitting in silence, that takes trust. It takes faith. It takes risking an openness that reveals one true self this is what God wants. This is why the divine yearns for men and women to be still and know that I am God. I know that in the church, this is one of the most difficult things that we can ever do. When it comes to silent prayer, when it says that we need to take a moment of silent contemplation and reflection, we become uneasy. We don't know what to do with ourselves. We're not even sure how to approach that time with God. And yet, it is sitting in silence that we learn to trust God. It is taking faith and risking an openness that reveals our true self to God. This is what God wants. This is why the divine yearns for men and women to be still and know God. In a way, Peter does succeed in avoiding another theological landmine by chattering about his proposed construction project. At least this time, when he's reprimanded, it's not for saying the wrong thing. When last he misspoke, Jesus likened Peter to Satan. This time, the voice from the divinely sent cloud makes no reference at all to the content of Peter's suggestion. 
In fact, the voice is far more reassuring than it is judgmental. Instead of picking on Peter and his silly suggestion, it says, Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. The third way we end up with our foot and mouth disease is by trying to take control of a situation and have the last word. Of course, the more we long to take control, the more we realize just how dependent on others we are. Perhaps the most famous story of the life of Bishop Fulton Sheen concerns the time that he was scheduled to speak in Philadelphia. Unfamiliar with the city, Sheen nevertheless decided to walk from his hotel to the town hall and got hopelessly lost. He saw some young people talking and asked them to direct him to his destination. And one of the kids asked Sheen, what are you going to do there? And the bishop replied, I'm going to give a lecture. About what? Oh, how to get to heaven. Would you care to come along? Are you kidding, said the kid. You don't even know how to get to the town hall, let alone heaven. Peter's ill-considered attempt to take control of the mountaintop experience of transfiguration also led him far away from the intended goal. Instead of getting his building project underway, Peter found himself under the cover of God's protective cloud. And instead of taking up a tidy little construction task, Peter found himself with the enormous gift of a lifelong discipleship in the service of the kingdom. Only a joyless, heartless, relentless round of existence comes from always being one in control, relinquishing the reins of our lives to God, playing out our lives as genuine disciples of the transfigured Jesus, the transforming Christ, is the only way that we will experience the glory of the living Lord. The reason mountaintop experiences stand out so dramatically is that those are exactly the moments when we are least in control and most in God. We are all commoners. We all stand in the same need of God's grace and God's love. The poet Keith Green wrote, My eyes are dry, my prayers are cold, my heart is hard, my faith is old, and I know now how I ought to be, alive to you and dead to me. What can be done with a hard heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Now wash me anew in the wine of your blood. Today I ask you, will you let go of the fears, of the words, of control, that you might become transfigured into the likeness and the image of Jesus Christ, the beloved of God? This Lenten season, I want to challenge you to share in this a silent time with God in the discipline of prayer. This week begins the season of Lent on Wednesday. And I would ask you to take the time to go to God. We have copies of the Lenten prayer guide available to you and hope to have it on the church Facebook page for those of you at home. Read and follow the guide. Come closer to your God. Lent begins when we open up our heart and listen in silence to our God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we go through each and every day that we would put our hand in your hand, that we would take the time to listen to what it is that you're calling us to do and how you want us to live. Lord, we know that in all things you are powerful and mighty. With you, nothing is impossible. We can come to you with all of those things that burden us. But we also need to come and glorify your holy name. For you are the wondrous, all-powerful God. You are the one who has shown us that you know what's going on all the time, in every place. And that through that, you have shown the power and your love through Jesus Christ and his willingness to be with us, to go and live life the way that we do, and then to extend the hand that is the hand of forgiveness. Help us during this Lenten season as we prepare our lives and our hearts to receive what you have to offer. When we come 
to Easter. We want to be ready, we want to be willing, and we want to surrender to you. So Lord, during this Lenten season, may we find the times to show that we understand your presence and keep silent and listen, that we will give up the control and that we will search for the meaning that you have given to life itself. Now, Lord, help us through this season to grow in the love of grace and the understanding of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Amen. glad that you've taken the time to be with us today and I pray that as you go from this place that your heart will be drawn closer to God. And now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go now in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good and pleasing in the sight of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, from this day forward and forevermore. Amen. <music>